Could you survive the ultimate workplace trial? Imagine being placed in a floating city, a massive platform drifting in the middle of the ocean, where you'll call home for the next four months. There's no leaving, you're 15 meters from the nearest shore, surrounded by nothing but water and sky. Yet, despite the harshness, crews come back repeatedly, proving that human resilience can thrive even under the most unforgiving conditions. The first thing that hits you on any offshore rig is the noise. Steel groans against ice, waves hammer the concrete base with relentless power, and machinery hums ceaselessly, filling every corner with vibration and sound. Your temporary home is a 200,000-ton structure, engineered to withstand 60-foot waves and temperatures that drop to minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet, despite this massive engineering feat, it shifts and sways unpredictably beneath your feet a constant reminder that you're at the mercy of the ocean. As oil prices are falling, which is providing an extra challenge to an industry with an aging workforce that really needs a new generation of workers. This floating city rises 30 stories from the seabed to the helipad, but almost all the functional space fits within a footprint no larger than a supermarket. Every inch has been designed with survival as the top priority. The concrete base is reinforced with enough steel to build four Eiffel Towers. When Arctic ice forms, angled ice shields break it into harmless chunks before it can impact the platform. Even the walkways rest on sliding bearings, allowing them to move during storms and preventing structural damage. Every element exists for protection first, comfort second. Life on a rig is dangerous in ways that land-based workplaces rarely are. A minor equipment malfunction can escalate into a catastrophe within minutes when you're 15 meters from the shore. The platform has seven independent shutdown systems that engage automatically if sensors detect gas leaks, pressure fluctuations, or structural stress. Every corridor is lined with emergency breathing masks, spaced no more than 50 feet apart, ready for instant use. Yet, the most formidable challenge isn't physical, it's psychological. Living quarters are windowless. During the dead of winter, you may not see natural sunlight for weeks at a time. Shifts run on a strict 12 hours on, 12 hours off schedule, regardless of storms or calm seas. Sleeping during a tempest means lying in a vibrating bunk, listening to metal screech under wind gusts that can reach 80 miles per hour. Crews quickly learn to compartmentalize fear. Hesitation during an emergency can cost lives. Ironically, evacuation is not always the safest choice. Survival pods cannot outrun Category 5 hurricanes. Sometimes the only viable option is to ride out the storm inside the steel walls of the platform, trusting the engineering to hold. So, why do people willingly return to this environment? The answer is preparation and meticulous safety measures. Food supplies last up to 60 days. Water purification systems can handle 60,000 gallons a day. Backup generators can power the entire rig for weeks. Crews bond through shared hardship, often developing non-verbal communication to work effectively in high noise areas. Many say they prefer the predictability of rig life. Every risk is calculated, measured, and contained. New recruits undergo six months of intensive specialized training before ever setting foot on the deck. They learn to detect the faint odor of hydrogen sulfide at just one feet per minute, practice evacuating smoke-filled corridors blindfolded, and memorize emergency protocols to the point of reflex. The platform operates with military-like precision because any lapse, however minor, could trigger a chain reaction of failures. Veteran workers often describe a strange comfort in this routine. Mastering the chaos becomes second nature. The ocean tests you in ways no land-based job ever could. Meeting those challenges builds a sense of accomplishment and pride that an office job could never provide. But the rig also forces you to adapt to a reality where the concept of day and night loses all meaning. Drilling never stops. Someone is always working while someone else attempts to sleep. Night shift workers wake to the hum of machinery and the flicker of fluorescent lights at 11.30 p.m. By midnight, they're eating a full dinner in the canteen because the kitchen operates around the clock. There is no conventional lunch time. Instead, breaks are scheduled strategically at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 10 a.m., and noon to maintain steady energy levels. Fatigue is omnipresent, the unseen enemy of every worker. Meals are more than sustenance. They are a tactical necessity. The dining hall stays open 24-7. 
Hot meals are served at 6 a.m. and 2 p.m., but sandwiches, fruit, and coffee are available at all hours. Workers must eat whenever possible, not when they are hungry. Some develop habits of taking double meals, stacking calories before long stretches of physical labor. The kitchen staff meticulously balances protein and carbohydrates to counteract exhaustion and maintain strength for rigorous work. Sleeping is not a given, it is a skill. Cabins are shared by workers on opposite shifts, meaning that one person's alarm can interrupt another's rest. Earplugs are mandatory, but they cannot completely block the vibration of the drilling equipment or the occasional jolt from seismic activity. Veterans can sleep through tremors that would send a newcomer bolting upright. Still, no one's body ever fully rests. Breaks are strictly enforced. No worker can exceed their shift, no matter how urgent the task may seem. A two-week on, three-week off rotation is common, giving crews time to recover after marathon shifts. Even bathroom breaks are carefully timed to maintain operational focus. Despite the severity, the rig's routines become normal quickly. Within a week, midnight steaks and coffee at 3 a.m. feel completely ordinary. Bodies recalibrate to the platform's rhythm. Crews develop a shared vocabulary of fatigue, the thousand-yard stare, automatic movements, and dry humor about rig time being a different time zone. In this isolated world, the only clock that matters is the one counting down to the next break or the helicopter ride home. The platform itself is a study in multifunctional design. Every structure serves multiple purposes. Walkways double as escape routes. Equipment rooms feature fold-down workbenches. Railings even incorporate measurement markings for rapid equipment checks. Living quarters occupy just 15% of the total structure, cramming 240 people into areas intended for half that number on land. Your assigned bunk measures 6.5 feet long and 3 feet wide, with a curtain for a door. Showers run on a 90-second timer, started by pressing a button that activates an LED countdown, conserving energy-intensive desalinated water. Hygiene routines become almost military in precision. Soap before water, shampoo during the rinse cycle. Dining operations follow similar exacting standards. The communal area accommodates only 80 people at a time, despite serving nearly three times that number daily. Hot meals rotate every eight days to avoid monotony, with every supply, down to the last potato, meticulously accounted for. Shared spaces are both practical and social battlegrounds. Smoking areas function as informal meeting rooms, despite official prohibitions. The small cinema plays films on loop, and workers strategically time their visits to avoid crowds. Internet access is limited and monitored. Video calls drain bandwidth, forcing most to rely on text-based messaging. Gym equipment folds against walls when not in use, maximizing scarce space. Vertical movement dominates life on the rig. To reach the operations deck from your bunk, you climb 47 steps and pass through seven fireproof bulkhead doors. Storage solutions exploit height rather than width. Toolboxes stack vertically. Laundry chutes service multiple floors. Maintenance crews rely more on wall-mounted ladders than traditional corridors. The platform's design prioritizes safety over comfort, forcing workers to navigate a steel labyrinth hundreds of times each day. Yet this constraint breeds remarkable efficiency Workers memorize exact distances, from the drilling console to the first aid station, from the fastest stairwell and blackouts to emergency evacuation routes. Newcomers adapt within days, moving instinctively even during drills. The constant lack of personal space fades into background awareness. What would be claustrophobic on land becomes simply another work parameter, as natural as checking oxygen levels or securing tools before a storm. Metal lockers hold only one change of clothes. Bathroom mirrors display laminated hygiene checklists. Outlets are vertically mounted to conserve surface area. Yet many workers report feeling more organized than in sprawling land-based facilities. Scarcity breeds discipline. Misplacing items becomes nearly impossible, creating paradoxical efficiency in a crowded steel environment. Psychological strain peaks around week 12. The novelty wears off, land remains distant, and time begins to blur. Artificial lighting erases circadian rhythms. Some workers develop rig eyes, staring blankly at walls during downtime, caught between exhaustion and hyper-awareness. Recruitment processes include psychological evaluations for stress tolerance and coping with isolation. Training covers not only emergencies, but 
conflict resolution, because cabin fever can spark tensions no manual can predict. Crews joke about the three-week itch, when irritations peak before stabilizing into uneasy tolerance. Shared coping mechanisms emerge. Weekly grievance sessions provide structured outlets, while pranks and rituals relieve tension in a controlled manner. Crew members learn to detect subtle changes in one another. Missed coffee, altered shower routines, shifts in eating patterns. Hyper-awareness becomes a critical safety tool, preventing small issues from escalating into crises. Isolation fosters unusual intimacy. You may not know a coworker's hometown, but you notice immediately if they skip their usual routines. This attention becomes the platform's invisible safety net. The bond among coworkers evolves from professional to essential. Emergency drills, where masks fog or evacuation harnesses tangle, teach trust. Crews cover shifts for one another, swap bunks when seasickness strikes, and quietly monitor psychological well-being. Odd traditions emerge, elaborate pranks, weekly ritualized complaint sessions, or dark humor shared in small doses. These micro-connections strengthen resilience more than any formal exercise. Physical and psychological stress manifests in unexpected ways. Workers report phantom vibrations, compulsively counting steps, checking locks, or other repetitive behaviors. Nail-biting escalates, nervous laughter becomes uncontrollable, and depression medications are available discreetly to prevent stigma from interfering with care. The reality is stark. Oil rigs will operate until at least 2050, long after today's workers retire. Generations of crews will endure these conditions. Claustrophobic bunks, time-limited showers, 12-hour shifts, relentless noise, and constant vigilance. Next time you fill your gas tank, remember the sacrifices behind every gallon. Months away from loved ones, sleep deprivation, and the constant battle against fatigue and danger. Could you survive? Type rig life if you believe you could endure even a single month. This story isn't just about oil platforms. It's about the human cost behind the energy we use without a second thought. The offshore world is brutal, beautiful, and demanding, and those who endure it redefine the limits of resilience. Want to see how humans survive the impossible? Subscribe now and go behind the scenes of the world's most extreme jobs.